Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here, and it is the month of May. It's the month of May, and you know, before we start with today's sermon, I just kind of wanted to talk to you and let you know a couple of things. The first of which is we are back. We are fully back. Our church is open. We're back to two services, back to doing things how we always used to. When you come on Sunday morning, it's going to feel normal. Uh, we have two services, one at 9.30 and 11, and we have a fellowship time with coffee and donuts in between. If you choose to come to our 11 o'clock hour, we have a program for our little ones as well as our junior high and high school students, and we would love to see you. You know, the church has been slowly, uh, progressively coming back, attendance is rising, and so we just wanted to just take a couple of seconds and just say, we miss you. We miss you, we miss your face, we miss your hugs, we miss your love, we miss your laughter. Please consider uh, returning. We would love to see you and spend the morning with you. And so as America uh, has people returning back to church after the pandemic, I think it causes some of us in church leadership to ask, well, what is keeping people away? And I feel one of the reasons that people avoid church, we talked about this last week, we said, you know, some people think church is boring. And I think there's another group of people that maybe think that church or being a Christian limits their life. So rather than finding fulfillment and their enjoyment in being a follower of Jesus, they see Christianity as the opposite of that. They see faith as a list of rules and regulations about how you can and can't live your life. Now, I know that this is not the only reason that people might reject Christianity, but I feel it is certainly one of the major reasons why. And for the past couple of weeks, we've been in the book of Philippians and listening to Paul. He is our author. And if you've ever wondered why uh, p- pastors mention Paul so much in their sermons, it's because most of the New Testament was written by him. 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament are authored by Paul. Plus, What makes the book of Philippians so interesting is that this is one of the books that we consider to be one of his prison letters. So Paul is imprisoned uh, many times, actually, more than once for preaching the gospel. And some of the other books we believe that were written while Paul was in jail would be Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And so when you consider the tone of his letters, and then you also consider where he is at the time, I think it only adds to the subject matter as we read it, because in none of these letters do we ever see Paul uh, complaining or bemoaning his circumstance. He's not asking his readers to help him break out of jail. (laughs) I mean, who of us would write letters to our friends on the outside whose, whose subject heading didn't begin with, get me out of here, right? I mean, probably few of us, if any, Paul shows through his writings that you can find joy even in the bleakest of circumstance. The city of Philippi was founded in the 4th century BC. It was named after the father of Alexander the Great, who was Philip II, and later it was conquered by the Romans and became an entirely Roman colony. So the fact that Philippi is a Roman colony is very significant because it means that It is a tiny micro version of Rome itself. So all the citizens that live in Philippi would have the same rights and privileges as anybody who lives in Rome proper. And as a Roman colony, that means that the people there took allegiance to Rome. And at the time that uh, Paul is writing this to the Philippian church, Nero is the emperor. Nero was, uh, he was a strong personality. And by the time that Paul writes this, Nero already has his subjects refer to him as Curios and Soter, which means Lord and Savior. And so the populace at Philippi would have been very resistant to any message that would have jeopardized their privilege as a Roman citizen and certainly would have opposed any message that didn't uphold Nero. So when Paul writes this church with encouragement, especially encouragement that says, 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Paul says he's encouraged, right? He says, I'm encouraged that despite Rome's oppression and despite my absence, I am pleased to hear that you are still unified as a church. And today I think another reason that people aren't flooding back to church yet is that we're, we've all grown used to not going anywhere. We've just all grown used to not going out. We are now happy to be at home. We're comfortable. We're around the house. We're in our sweatpants. Uh, many of us are probably evaluating things that we used to do and wondering, do I still want to do those things? For others of us, COVID became sort of like a, a do-over or a refresh or a way to reinvent yourself, or it was an opportunity to try something different. So what does that mean for the church? What does that mean for not just the church of 2021, but what will that mean for the church of 2022? What happens next? Because I think ultimately, as people of the church, we want to make a difference. We want to live lives that matter. And that's what we're talking about. So as we look at Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 12. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Now, a good rule with any Bible study is that whenever you see the phrase, therefore, you should always back up a couple of verses and ask yourself, what is it there for? Right? What is it there for? Why say therefore? Well, a couple of verses before this, Paul says in verse 9, God has highly exalted him, that would be Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the mission of the church. That's the mission of the church, to preach and teach the name of Jesus Christ so that one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. And the church would say, well, okay, how do we do that? How do we do that, Paul? Paul says, work out your own salvation. But what does that mean? work out your own salvation. Now, notice he doesn't say work for, right? He, he says work out. We don't work for our own salvation. We're not saved by works. Nothing we say or do saves us. So think about it. How do we use the phrase work out today in our everyday language? How, maybe we would say something like, wow, you look good. Do you work out? right? We would say, you look fit, you look trim, you look thin, you look muscular. Do you work out? And their answer would be yes, right? Because that's the reason why they look good. They didn't exercise one time and then just come away with a perfect body. If that was the case, that would be what we would all do. We would exercise once and be done with it. No, to have a fit, trim body exercise has to be a routine. It must be a weekly or a daily practice. If I ask you, do you work out? What I mean is, do you work out regularly, right? Are you regularly working out? That would be the same for our salvation. The rest of your life, you are working out your salvation with Jesus. In John 5, 17, Jesus says, my father is working until now, and I am working. God is working. God never stops working. And so we, as people who want to live lives that matter, we never stop working. If God is working, we are working. If Jesus is leading the way, we follow. We don't say, oh, okay, oh, okay, that's, that's far enough, Jesus. Whoo, I've gone, I've gone far enough. This is as far... This is as far as I want to go. Uh, that's all, that is all the way I want to go in my faith. That makes no sense. 
If you and I want to live a life that matters, if we want to make a difference, if we want to belong to something that's even bigger than ourselves, well then of course, we need to work out. So how do we work out? Well, first we start with our commitment muscle. Paul says that obedience to Christ is the key to living the Christian life. Elsewhere, Paul writes, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You know, in a nation of individuals, as creatives, as progressives, we don't like the word obey. We're even slowly removing it from our wedding vows. And it's another reason why people might avoid church. But there is an obedience problem in our homes and in our schools and in our government and even in church. But God requires it. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And James says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. William Bradford, who was the governor of the Plymouth Colony, this is a pilgrim, he said, those who believe in the Holy Scriptures are bound to observe its teachings. Those who do not are to be bound by its consequences. I'm sure you've probably seen the sign that says under new management somewhere, right? And a sign like that, I think, most accurately describes the human condition. It describes the Christian heart. When Christ takes over your life, your life is instantly under new management. And it's hard. I know. It is hard. It is a hard lesson to learn, to acknowledge that there is a new authority in our life. How hard it would be for those people that so thoroughly enjoyed the tangible world to now have to obey Jesus. But that is what we are called to do. Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Paul looks at this church and he says, you are showing the ultimate marker for maturity. Not just somebody who obeys and acts right when somebody's looking. Paul congratulates this church for their obedience even in his absence. But notice Paul also says, work out your own salvation. Paul is in jail. And he writes, you're not always going to have me around. Obedience is a sign of maturity, yes, but even more so when there is obedience without the reminder to be prompted, to be started, to be initiated, when you can obey on your own. Paul says, I want you to have your own grown-up mature salvation, a salvation that belongs to you. This is not your mom's salvation or your dad's salvation or mine. It's not, not, it's not your pastor's salvation. This belongs to you. Next, we work out our caution muscle. How do we work out our salvation, Paul says? With fear and trembling. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be trembling? Should I be worried that if I don't exercise my faith, that means I will lose my faith? No, not at all. And that means, though, that while we are exercising our faith, we must be mindful that we always honor and respect God through that process. A little boy who was excited about giving his life over to Jesus at Vacation Bible School came home and he wanted to tell his friend, he said, I got a new heart today. And his friend said, let me see it. The world outside is asking that same question of us. If we say that we are saved, if we say that we are under new management, if we say that we have a new heart, the world outside wants to see our changed life. We can't just say that we're living a life that matters. There has to be some evidence of it. The book of Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
The book of Corinthians says, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Why does Paul say fear and trembling? Because fear leads to respect. Fear can even lead me to worship. Because when you have a, let's just say you have a fear of death, right? You have a fear of death or you have a fear of illness. That can lead to a worship of health and fitness. Fearing the Lord means that we are in awe of his holiness. And we want to give him complete reverence. We want to honor him. And we're going to acknowledge that he has all glory and all majesty and all power over our lives. For example, God revealed himself to the Israelites and they trembled in fear. So much so that they begged Moses. They said, please don't let that ever happen again. From now on, you be the mediator between us and God. We never want to see God face to face again. Paul says, when Jesus comes back, what did, what did Paul say would happen? Paul says, when Jesus comes back, every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Well, guess what? That's fear and trembling. That's why when you hear that somebody else is a God-fearing person, that probably makes you respect that person a little bit more. Because if they fear God, then they are more than likely to keep their word, more than likely to treat others with kindness. In fact, Romans 3, which is the classic chapter on sin, says that our chief sin, our chief sin is having no fear of God at all. What do you think? Is there a lot of fear and trembling in today's church? We need more fear of God, more respect, more awe, and less confidence and less arrogance in ourselves. Third, we exercise that confidence muscle. See, before we were saved, God was calling out to us. He was wooing us to come into a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. But after we were saved, well, we had the Holy Spirit and we had the very power of God within us to help us. So when Paul writes that God, in verse 13, works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure, what that means is God prompts our heart through the Holy Spirit to bring us to do God's will. He gives us that desire. I now have the desire to please God, the desire to do God's will. And I have the confidence that the Holy Spirit will equip me to do it. We have to allow ourselves to follow that prompting, to follow that lead. And that desire in us will then lead us to his will, lead us to fulfilling his purpose. God will give us all the help and all the energy to do the things that he calls us to do. The world needs to see these examples of faithful obedience. We can find happiness in life when we are realizing that we are called to be that example. He wants you to live a life that matters. So he's gonna equip you. So take confidence. God is working right now. He's not waiting for us. <laughs> he's not waiting for you or me. He's working right now all over the world without me. And yet he's invited me to join him. Paul says, what's the goal? What's the end game? The goal is every knee bow and every tongue confesses, right? So what do we do? We obey, we obey. And we work out our faith with fear and trembling. I think we all agree that we have lost a lot of momentum these past two years. We want things to go back to normal, but they won't. They won't. And that's scary. The truth is, the world will never be the same. We've crossed another one of those milestone moments that will have changed the world forever. And now we're staring down the summer of 2021, and we ask God, 
What do you want us to do? How can we surrender to your will? How can we serve you more? How can we love the neighborhood even more? What is God going to say? Is he going to say, give to missions? Is he going to say, go on a mission trip? Is he going to say, quit your job? Is he going to say, move? Is he going to say, I want you to serve in the inner city. I want you to talk to your neighbors. I don't know. But with fear and trembling, we need to work that out. I don't know what God will require of us, but I know the first step. The first step is obedience. Let's pray together. Lord, change is always scary. And as we look towards what life will be like without COVID, we recognize that the world has changed once again. The world has changed forever. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what tomorrow will look like. Give us the confidence that we need to step forward into that, knowing that you hold our hand and guide us. And we do not go forward into the future alone. The future of the church is not in our hands, it is in yours, because it's your church, and we are yours. Lord, you instruct us to obey your word and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's the inner work that we have to do. It's the inner path that we take, the road that we are on. And sure, many times we want to stop and rest, take a break. But you never stop working. You are always working because the goal is one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. And you invite us along. You take us with you. Give us the confidence that we need to step out. Give us the encouragement that we need to do your will. Give us calm hearts and calm voices that we might listen and know your will. Embolden us to be your church. That we might embrace a new vision for 2021. That we might still see your church as beautiful and that we seek every day to fill it with those who love you. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please come and join us in person. We would love to see you once again. I'm so happy that you are here. Don't forget that you can always uh, copy the address up at the top. You can post this to your own Facebook wall or share it with a friend who you think might need to hear this this morning. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.